Yes, hello and good morning, everyone. So our next person for our next presentation, we have um, Leandro Enrique Colombo. Leandro, it's right now uh, Lecovi, no well known in, in 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 Twitter Twitter handle. Uh, so Leandro, I had the opportunity to meet him uh, back in the in the last the latest PyCon U PyCon US PyCon Charles. Very nice person. And uh, so Leandro works uh, currently working at Mercado Libre as a manager of the Python ecosystem. Um, he is also a co-organizer since 2013, since 2000, 2016 of PyCon Argentina, so where he currently lives. Um, today, Leandro is going to be talking about understanding Python virtual environments and Python virtual apps. Hi, Leandro. How are you doing? How are you doing? Good to see you again. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm very glad uh, I am hosting you this morning. Um, it was a really nice experience when we met back up PyCom, PyCon US. And this is what I mentioned earlier. PyComs uh, conferences are for those type of things. Knowing people, I got the honor to meet Leandro. And uh, here we are now. And so we are not two strangers. We're two persons that we had the opportunity to talk. Yeah, that was awesome. I, I hope to see you again, uh, just to share a couple of years and a nice chat as we used to. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so I'm going to be leaving you the stage and good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, well, uh, just let me say you hello. Good morning, everyone. This is Understanding Python Virtual Lens, uh, a friendly guide for everyone. Here I will share with you the link of the slides if you want to follow them onto your own site. First of all, uh, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation, of course, the confidence. Also, I want to thank to the sponsors who made this possible, and of course, to you people for being on the other side watching this. Uh, okay, let me get started with who am I? Uh, my name is Leandro, but many people know me as Lecovi, as my social media handlers. And I'm currently working as a software manager at Mercado Libre, building the Python infrastructure inside our internal development platform. And um, I'm also a professor in Buenos Aires City, the city where I live. And I'm also the treasurer of the Python Argentina NGO. But we are not here to talk about me. Uh, if you want to talk, of course, feel free to contact me. Uh, I want to tell you how this talk is going to be. First, uh, I want to review together how a program is executed in your computer. Then I will summarize how a Python environment works. Uh, after that, I will share some tools to manage virtual lens. And finally, I will share some uh, final thoughts and I will answer to your question, of course, if you have them. This talk is aimed to everyone. Uh, everyone who wants to have a better understanding of what a Python virtual environment is or as we call it, uh, a virtual M. It's just a quick review, and I will show some of the most popular tools to work with in your projects. I love to start my talks with a quote, since I didn't find any clever quote regarding Python virtual ends, I'll start this quote of a comedian Argentinian group called Lelutiers that I just found it brilliant. Of 10 people who watch TV, five are hot. Okay, let's get this party started. What happens when you type Python in your terminal? You are calling a binary file, which is in your file system. The operating system assigned resources, and now your computer is able to execute the program. Now you can communicate with your computer using Python syntax. You are controlling your computer, your computer with Python in an interactive way or calling it with another file with Python code inside it. Either case, the process is exactly the same. Wait, wait, wait. 
Yeah, I know. It's too early in the morning. And I already mentioned final file, operative system, resources, all kind of weird stuff. If you let me, I will take a little shortcut, a little didactic shortcut just to explain how this is working. I'm going to use a four layer model. Two layers are pretty obvious. The user space where your apps live and the hardware, that's what you can touch. And two more layers are not so many obvious. The shell and the kernel. Both are usually what we call the operative system. The user space is your playground, what you are used to use. Here, your applications take life. Uh, a word processor, the web browser, your favorite text editor, or the photo editor. All kind of apps, being them visible or not, like perhaps Dropbox or the antivirus, whatever runs in the background. The shell is the interface provided by the operative system to communicate with. The shell can be a graphic shell using your mouse, uh, interacting with icons and windows, like perhaps Microsoft Windows or Mac OS, or your favorite Linux distribution. The shell can be also a CLI, a common line interface, where you type your commands. You use the terminal, who is the program responsible to interact with the shell, like Power Shell in Windows or Bash in Mac or Linux. The kernel is the one responsible to administrate the hardware resources. When we are talking about resources, we are talking about memory, runtime, those kind of things. Programs consume those resources, and the OS is the one responsible to use them wisely to not to have problems. Last but not least is the hardware. The electric circuits, the CPU who executes the instructions, the memory where instructions and data are stored, and the input-output system like your keyboard, the monitor, your speakers, my webcam, the network interface, whatever your computer uses to communicate with the outside world. Okay, well, but how this is happening. You use the terminal to access the OS shell using the CLI. You ask the shell to execute a command, just writing the command name and pressing enter. The shell has a directory list where it's able to find those executable files. It's what you probably know as an environment variable called path. The shell finds the executable and make the necessary request to the kernel. The kernel assigns resources, basically memory and CPU time, to your program and now is able to execute. Finally, the hardware executes the instructions. Everything inside your computer is either a one or a zero, stored in the memory and where it moves around the circuits because everything turns out to be a simple electric pulse that our circuits can understand. Okay, let's recap. A binary file has instructions inside that that the kernel can pass through the CPU so he can execute them. The shell is the user interface to call these executables. If the shell could find it in the path, then the EOS can run it. Always that the binary file has the instruction for that OS, of course. Let's recap together. Using which, you can find where the executable is in your file system. If you go deeper, actually, this is a file that points to several symbolic links. With a file command onto the last one, you can realize that this example 
is a Linux executable. This exact same file is not able to run on a Windows machine. Okay, let's see how a Python environment is. Let's execute Python again, but running it with the site model. The site model brings us some details about your environment, your environment. In particular, you can see the path list that Python uses to find the packages. You can see the standard lib directory. You also find a global third-party packages directory at a operative system level. And finally, the user third-party packages directory. Note that the, this last one has presence over the global directory. Okay, but till now you didn't hear why you should use a virtual end. Let's think about this case. You have a project with a client, a very nice client, with an old Flask application. It's a Flask old version. You don't use virtual amps, you don't need them, you never did. It's the only project you have and it's good enough to pay your bills. But inflation, economic crisis, or whatever, and suddenly you need more clients to pay your bills. So you find a new client and this new client is a little bit more demanding and requires the features that the new Flask version has. Oh man, you realize you can install two versions of Flask in your computer in the global scope. You can update your legacy code because it's not a valid option. You have no time for this and also you can't charge your previous client for it. You have no chance. You have to buy another machine. No, 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 no. Wait, you can use of course, virtual ends. With virtual ends, you can avoid third-party dependency versions collision, not only with the ones that you declare as a primary debt, also with the transitive ones. Besides, you gain detail of what your project really needs. You don't have mixed dependencies because that brings us a better and clear environment. You also have more control over your project. You can create as many virtual lamps as you want. You can easily test new things in a very simple and clean way. Let me show you the standard lib directory content. In my case, the path was slash usr slash lib slash python 3.9. If you see this, now you can understand why Python has batteries included. There are many, many packages. Just let me go deeper. Here, you can find the packages you probably used to use. Perhaps URL lib, typing, or unitest. And you can see a very particular package that it's called BMV. This package came since Python 3.3, and it's recommended to use since Python 3.6. Well, then, let me tell you about some tools. The first one, of course, is the BMV module. You can execute Python calling the BMV module with the BMV command to create a new virtual end column called BMV. Okay. No, I'm not a creative person, but it's not that. It's a, just a convention. You can choose whatever name that suits you. In my case, we'll create a new PMV directory inside, inside my working directory. There you can find the site packages directory where third-party packages will be installed. You can also find the executables and they are pointing to the ones in your system and you'll also find the necessary scripts to
to activate the virtual ends. Activate the virtual end is just execute a script, which modifies the Python path in your shell. That's why after activating, the prompt is modified. You can see the virtual end named between parentheses. If you run which again, you will see the new Python is the one inside your BMV directory. If you run with the site model, you can see the modified Python path. It's now in another place in my file system. Everything you run inside your BMV, it will only happen for this virtual M. If you run pip, it will install dependencies inside this virtual M. To deactivate and go back to normal, just run the deactivate command. Okay, once again, recap. The tools that I'm going to show you next are using the same concept that we just learned. We need to activate them to use the environment to work with and then deactivate it to go back to normal. Although not every tool will do it the same way. But everyone will provide an isolated and a safe environment for you. Let's see the second tool I want to share with you. It's called PPAM. It's a tool that will handle your dependencies installation and will take care of your virtual ends. There, you can have the repo URL. To create a new virtual end, run the PPAM command. PPAM will create a new virtual end and then will tell you where in your file system is. Check that the default virtual end path is not the same directory as your current working directory, although you can configure that behavior. What is interesting about PPM is there is a new file called the PIP file. This, this file is the one that we need to use with our dependencies. It's like the requirements.txt, but it has more capabilities. I don't actually have time to review all the capabilities, but I encourage you, you to explore the official documentation to get a better understanding. Here, eh, to activate the virtual end, you just need to run the ppm shell command. You can see now the virtual M is active. You have the name of the virtual M inside the parentheses to the left of the prompt. PPM will name the virtual M with the same name as the directory has. If you use the site model, you can see the Python path has changed. The same way to deactivate, you just need to run the deactivate command. The great thing about PPM is that you don't need to activate the virtual end to use it. Running the PPM subcommands inside your working directory, your working directory is where the PIP file is, is enough for PPM to execute their actions inside the correct virtual end. To manage and install dependencies, you only need to use PPM subcommands. If you want to install Flask inside this virtual end, just run the pipm install flask. Notice that pipm also creates another file called pipfile.log. Inside the pipfile.log files are all the dependencies, not just flask, with their specified version and their hash. All of them, not just flask, remember. Of course, pipm has many functionalities. I invite you to check out the documentation, explore, and play to get a better feeling about this tool. Okay, in third place, I want to share with you Poetry. It's very similar to PPM with a component that is the publish, the publish process of a PyPI package. Here you can see the main URL of this tool. To create a new virtual M, 
with poetry needs a new file. It's a file called the pyproject.toml file. This standard follows the PAP621. If you don't know how to write it, poetry has a subcommand to create it in a new project, that is poetry init. Poetry interface is very similar to BPM. Poetry shell creates or activates a virtual end. Like BPM, doesn't create the virtual end directory inside the working directory and is configurable too. Also, PPAM poetry takes the name of the working directory to set the name of the virtual M, but poetry adds a, a semi-random string. You already know, if you run the site module, you can check that the Python path has changed. Like the previous tools with the activate, you go back to normal. As BPEN, you don't need to have the virtual end active to run the commands inside it. Poetry has a very complete interface for this. And only being at the directory, at the root directory with the pyproject.toml file, it's enough to poetry to recognize the correct virtual end. For example, if you want to add Flask to your project, you need to use the add subcommand. Poetry also writes a log file. In this case, it's called poetry.log. The same as before, Poetry has many other functionalities, but I don't have time to share with them. I encourage you to explore them alongside the documentation that is very complete and very useful. Okay, the tools that I'm going to mention are very helpful. Are they have so many features and I only have time to mention them. PyM, it's a tool that will let you choose different Python versions for your project. It can run, for example, Python 3.9 or Python 3.10 or even Python 3.11 when you call Python. It helps you to easily change which Python version you will call when you run Python. I mean, when you type Python in your terminal. To be able to use virtual ends with pym, you also have to install the pym virtual end plugin. The second tool I want to share, well, or at least I want to mention with you, is Docker. Docker is a much more complex tool, but it will help you to isolate your whole app, not just your dependencies. Docker uses containers. If you are not familiar with it, I strongly recommend that you start exploring it. And the last tool I want to share with you is one that we developed in Python Argentina with one of my friends. It's called Fades. Let's use it. Fades lets you use your virtual ends without worrying about them. It's very, very helpful to make quick tryouts. Check out the official docs that are, that are in the official repository to get more into detail. Well, I'm getting done of this. Let's do a quick recap. I talked about 6.2 that let you work with Python dependencies in some kind of way to build you a stronger and reliable development environment. The first one, of course, the BMV module. It comes with the standard link. You can use it without further installation. It's pretty easy to use. The second one we talk about is PyPen. It's very interesting, it's very strong, and it's supported by the Python package authority. The third one, I just love it. It's what we use here in Mercado Libre as the standard. And last, I mentioned three more tools for you to explore. I mentioned about Fades, 
I mentioned about Docker, and I also mentioned about PyM. They're not actually both uh, Docker and PyM exactly for Python virtual end, but it will help you. The great thing about these six tools is they doesn't have conflicts with each other. They don't collide between them. You can use them all in the same project. So feel free to test them and find what, what, which is the right one for you. Now it's your turn. Here you have some useful resources. You will find the documentations that I mentioned in this talk and some interesting videos with complementary subjects. Well, I hope you had a great time. I know I did. Here you have the ways to reach me out. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you and have a great PyCon. That was a great presentation and, and uh, uh, you went through the different uh, ways that you can have a virtual environment. I enjoy that. I love that because, you, as you mentioned, is uh, uh, it's really hard when you have a you're you're tied to a specific version in the in the global system, and then you need to try something. As like a, right now, if you want to try Python three point eleven, that is gonna be out in the next few months. If you don't have one of these tools, it's gonna be almost impossible. Well, there are all the techniques, but. One of using what one of these techniques can can uh, make it easier for you to even to try new versions of the of Python. Yeah, and and, and also in, in in Mac OS systems and Linux distribution, Python is pretty used in some standard applications. So you can uh, scrabble in in your dependency system in the global scope pretty easy if you don't use virtual ends for your projects uh, mainly when you are trying out things or new libraries or new dependencies so it's yeah. it's pretty useful that's a very good point because i think uh mac os still uses python 2.7 if i know wrong right yeah if you run python i know in the last update i think that they may be they bump it to to and to the three yeah. at, finally okay yeah i think I, I'll just, I can check in a couple of minutes but uh when you type python it, it runs python 2.7 and and with a huge message that says this is uh, this is uh, um, oh don't use it but yeah. you still uh, ship it <laughs> yeah uh, well, Leandro, I don't see any questions, but if you, um, if any of you uh, have something that you want to ask Leandro, Leandro is going to be around. So in the lounge, yeah. in the chat, uh, but better use in the lounge because in the in the chat is going to be a private conversation. If you go to a lounge, you're going to have more people will have the opportunity to to discuss. So yeah. I invite you uh, to go there now uh, to have some conversations. Our next presentation is starting in 30 minutes. Um, yes, in 30 minutes specifically. And uh, Leandro, again, thank you very much for for getting for being with us to, to today and for this awesome presentation. See yeah. you around. See you around, and people have a great time. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.